I teach at a Bible college in Reno, as, you, as you, some of you know. And Brandon was a student there. He got his master's degree there, was a pastor at a church in Reno called Living Stones, went up to Eugene, became a pastor up there at a church. And now he's the associate pastor at Reno Christian Fellowship. And I said, would you come up and share with our body from the book of Acts? And he says, I'd love to. So would you welcome Brandon with me, please? Thanks, Tony. Yeah, it's, it's great to be with you today. Uh, Tony has been a mentor of mine. I've known him for now about a decade. And uh, he was my Greek professor, so a lot of how I'm able to even approach the scriptures has been shaped by Tony. I, I was thinking through, like, in the ways in which he's actually personally impacted me, and there was one really random thing, Tony, that you have influenced me with that, uh, that I still to this day do. And it's saying, remind me of your name. Has he done this to you? Anyone forgets a name? Remind me of your name. I feel like it's like the gentlest way of saying, like, I forgot, it's my fault, but not like, what is your name again? Or, or, or something like that. It's like, and so I say it to this day. If you, if you hear me say it, remind me of your name. That comes straight from Tony Slavin. But he, he's been a, a godly mentor and, and a, a faithful pastor, so I, I think you are, you are blessed to have him. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Right? <laughs> so. no. And, and to hear the story of the Perry family, that this church, what, what you guys are doing to support them, pray for them, I mean, that is amazing. That, that is a picture of what Christ is doing through the church by the power of his spirit. This whole series is to show the power of the spirit to be his witnesses, to, to, to actually live out what, what Christ has called us to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the book of Acts. And so I'm picking up at a, a spot in the book that is uh, problematic, it's troubling. It's, it's a difficult passage. But what leads up to it is this boom cycle of the Holy Spirit's activity, where the church started in an, in an upper room with, with uh, about a, maybe this size, amount, this amount of people. And to think that there, there was this poor itinerant preacher in a poor part of the world who sparked a movement that now includes you and I in one of the richest zip codes in the richest country in the world 2,000 years later. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me, apart from the Holy Spirit's activity. Amen? And so we see in the book of Acts, leading, leading up to the passage we're going to look at today, this community that was sharing all things. They had all things in common. There, it says there was no one among them that had need. So like the Perry family in the ancient church was completely provided for. It's people selling their properties and, and distributing to those who need it. It was a, a radical generosity spurred by the Holy Spirit. Something that just is countercultural, is something that doesn't make sense apart from something supernatural guiding people to say, we will give what we have so that you who don't have can have. And there's a man named Barnabas who is told was selling a field and just laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet. Like, you selling a lake house and just giving the proceeds to Tony, say, do what you, you can for ministry. I mean, it's like, it's something where it's like, it's unfathomable to think of that kind of generosity. <laughs> right? <laughs> Wait till we get in the passage and see what could happen with that. So. But, but it is something where the Spirit is prompting this transformation of the human soul in such a way that we live so counter the values of this world. And so that's the setup to this passage. Let me pray and then we are gonna dive in. God, you are so good to us. You have loved us even when we have not loved you back. You have unleashed a plan throughout human history to save us. And you are present with us now by your spirit, indwelling us, working through us and leading us to you. God, we know you preserve and protect us by your spirit. You energize us by your spirit. So would you, by your spirit, open our hearts and minds today to hear what you have to say to us. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are in the book of Acts, chapter 5. I think the verses will be on the screen. I haven't verified. But if you need a Bible, it looks like people in the back have Bibles that uh, they will be distributing. But... We are in Acts chapter 5, and here we go. 
After Barnabas, this, by the way, is where he has sold a field and given all this money. This is what sets up because there is a but. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. He died. And great fear came upon all those who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. That's Ananias' story. It's problematic, right? Like the, the, Tony actually gave me an out. He's like, this is the spot in Acts that we're here. I know you're a guest preacher. If you want to just skip past, like I can do it. But again, the whole, the whole point of this series is to show the power of the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. And this passage is integral to that because it, it, it challenges us. It says, who are we filled with? Are we filled with spirit or Satan? Are, are we pursuing holiness or hypocrisy? Because that's what the story leads us to, to see, that we can't fool God with anything. So, so what's happening here? I mean, it, it's problematic ethically. It seems that they're, I mean, Ananias and Sapphira have given at least some money to the church. This is a pretty stiff penalty to die, right, for giving at least some money to the church. It's, it's problematic intellectually. I mean, they, they, uh, Peter seems to have a supernatural ability to discern this, and, and it, he seems kind of heartless about it. It's like, what, what is really going on here? Well, the situation, they, they, they have sold property and they have held some back. And this is fully with Sapphira's knowledge. So this is, we got a Bonnie and Clyde marriage here. Like they are conspiring in this. The fact that they're holding back means that they are presenting something that is not actually true. They are presenting themselves as being wholly generous, but keeping some of the proceeds behind the scenes. So when Ananias presents the money to the church, Peter scolds him. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? You know, I think, like, what exactly is that crime? He's given something to the church. What is the crime? He's not obligated to even sell the property. Peter says that. He's like, when it remained unsold, was it not your own? Did it not remain your own? You could have done whatever you wanted with it. It was yours. And it's not like they were obligated to give all of it. The generosity in the early church was not a tax. It was voluntary. So Peter says, and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Okay. When you sold it, you could dump whatever you wanted with it. So what exactly did they do? What was the crime? They deceptively pretended to give it all and hold it back. That is hypocrisy. It's the, it's the word that plagues a lot of us in the church. It's a word, word that plagues churches around our nation, our world. Hypocrisy. That's what their crime is. Because hypocrisy is when the public self and the private self are two different things. When, when the, the public reputation and what's going on behind the scenes are two different things. The Greek word hypocrites, of which we get hypocrisy, referred to the masked actor in, in the Greek drama world where what the audience sees and, and what's actually behind the mask are two different things. And Jesus was pretty unimpressed with the hypocrites of his day. Is that an understatement? I mean, he calls them blind guides, blind fools, whitewashed tombs in the sense that their exterior is beautiful, inside they're just dead, rotting bones. He calls them a brood of vipers, little snake babies. I love Jesus, the way Jesus puts down the hypocrites, little snake babies. Like, Jesus railed against hypocrisy. That, that, that was a, a key aspect in his ministry, was calling out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of his day and saying to his followers, that is not how we will live. Two characteristics he gives of the hypocrite. If you're, if you're a note taker, here's your time to shine. Two characteristics. They preach but do not practice. 
I mean, they will tell other people to do something that they themselves will not do. You think uh, nationally, some, some of the pastors that have been up preaching against sexual immorality and then committing the worst kinds of sexual immorality behind the scenes. It's like that kind of phenomenon. Jesus is like, no, that, that, that is not of me. Second, what they do practice, they practice for the approval of others. When they do good, they want others to see it. That's the motivation. I want you to observe me giving so that you think higher of me. But it's not actually a, a, a heart of generosity. It's, it, it's not actually geared to honor God. It's geared to boost the esteem amongst others. And that's Ananias and Sapphira's form of hypocrisy here. That, that's what they have done. They have presented to the church a, 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 a generosity that isn't actually real or isn't as real as they're presenting it to be. And Peter sniffs this out. We, we don't know how. There is no ancient Zillow where they're able to see, like, you sold your property for this much, according to Zillow, and, and it seems like you're only given this much. Like, there's, there's nothing like that. Like, it, it, the details are relevant. Luke, Luke doesn't tell us. What is relevant is Peter's diagnosis of why it happened. This is where it's significant. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to man, but to God. This is one of the clearest statements of the Holy Spirit's divinity. Lied to the Spirit, lied to God. One and the same. You might try to fool us, Ananias, but you cannot fool God. And ultimately, your deception is aimed towards God because you're trying to present yourself as generous when you aren't actually. God can't be fooled. It's like, in effect, Ananias, you were not filled with the Spirit. It's the opposite. Being filled with Satan is the complete opposite of being filled with the Spirit. That's the reason for the hypocrisy. That's the reason for the action. And that's what Peter is getting down to. He's exposing what's actually in the heart of Ananias. And the exposure of that is too much for him. And he falls down dead, breathes his last, which is a, a clever word play, where the spirit, the breath of life, the pneuma that, that fills is gone. He breathes his last. He is dead. He falls down. Did Peter curse him or something? No, Luke, Luke doesn't give us the detail. I'm no medical doctor, but I would say that the sudden realization that you have been a hypocrite, that you have lied to God, could send you into shock and heart failure. I don't know, that's, that's what some propose. The detail is not there, it's not relevant. What is relevant is that it's immediate, it's sudden, people see it, hear about it, and they are freaked out. A great fear comes up, uh, upon all who heard it. Like, how could this happen? Am I next? Like, what, what have I done? Could, I, could, could this happen to me? Like, if, if Tony stood up, Brandon, you've been lying to the Holy Spirit. I fell down dead. You would be like, what? How on earth? Like, what, like it, it would send a, a, a holy fear, a shock. Uh, there would be some sense of, like, something is going on here that is beyond our comprehension. That's what's happening. Ananias dies, he's taken, he's buried, that's it. It's the end of his story. But then, three hours later, his wife Sapphira has her meeting. So we pick up in verse 7. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. He didn't give the detail, it's not important, but she says, yeah, that's, that's the amount. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came and found her dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. So she comes in three hours later, has no idea what has happened to her husband. Peter puts her to the test. She is committed to the lie. And so she says, yep, that's, that's exactly what we did. I mean, it is a full conspiracy between husband and wife. And Peter's dumbfounded. He's like, how did you both do this? How did you both conspire to do this? Like one of you couldn't have been the voice of reason? How many in your marriage or, or in your relationships have to say like, honey, that's a dumb idea? Like at some point you have to do that, right? And Peter's like, you couldn't, one of you couldn't have done that? 
One of you couldn't have said, hey, maybe we shouldn't test God in this. How did you both do this? How did you both conspire to do this? So it's like the same fate that met your husband is going to meet you too. She falls down dead. That's it. All who hear about it are, are freaked out. They're like, what is going on? Great fear came upon the whole church. So that's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You're, you're probably like, what does that have to do with me? What story? Okay, if I, if I sell a lake house and give to Tony, I'm not going to pretend that it's the whole thing when it's not. Like, you're like, got that. But not many of you are going to be in that position. So, so what is this really about? This, this story is not about us giving money. Like, that, that's not the, the key takeaway. Peter basically said, you have every right to do what you want to do with your possessions. It's like, it's, it's yours. The generosity is spurred by the Spirit, and that's what was exemplified in the early church. There is something that is a discipline about that. It's, it, as Tony said, it is biblical. But the, the point of this story is not, you better give, and, and when you give, give everything. That's not the point either. And it's not about lying in general. Like the, their crime is not so much that they lied. Like Peter wasn't saying, thou shalt not lie. And, and if you do, you die. He wasn't doing that. It's not about those things. It's about something deeper. It's about the war in our hearts. And that affects all of us. Because this is the fork in the road. Are we going to be filled with the Spirit or filled with Satan? There is no third option. And you, you might be thinking, that, that sounds really intense. But, that, but that's the fork in the road that, that God presents to us in the Bible. You're, you're either filled with the Spirit or you're filled with Satan. There is no third option. The Spirit is the one who leads to allegiance to Christ. The Spirit is the one who leads to a holiness. Satan leads to a worship of the things of the world. And with that, a hypocrisy amongst those who claim to be Christ's followers. Not, you're not either holy or a hypocrite, but Christians have the tug between holiness or hypocrisy. Ananias, that's what they faced. They, they had this hypocrisy masked as this holiness and it got sniffed out. Because being filled with, what we're filled with is all about control, what, what compels us, what guides us. The Spirit in, in filling us is guiding us towards the truth, is guiding us towards a way of living that the exterior matches the interior, right? A way that, that, is, that is a holistic, transformed human being. That's what the Holy Spirit is leading. Satan leads towards chaos, destruction, death, things that, that are the opposite of that. When you think Satan, don't think red dude with a pitchfork. That's not the picture. It is the spirit that is adversarial to God. Actually, the, the name Satan means adversary. So it is the, the spirit of, of the world, it, active in the world, that is leading towards the things of the world, the worship of the things towards the world, and not towards God. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira had succumbed to. That's what they had never actually overcome. They, they, they were controlled, compelled, guided by the spirit the spirit that is leading towards the worship of the things of the world. In their case, it was their money. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to be part of the community and appear as generous. They saw what Barnabas had done and they're like, yeah, we, we want that kind of cred to, to be given that kind of applause by others as being generous. But we want to hold on to our stuff. And, and we face those kinds of tugs as Christians. That's what leads to hypocrisy. But God is not fooled. He is not fooled. That comes right out of this story. And they faced a judgment right then and there. This is not just a historical event that we look back and go, oh, we, we, don't, we won't fill their example, or we don't, we don't, we don't uh, we'll just learn from them. It is actually a glimpse into the future. Because this is, this is where we all then will face some sort of judgment. We will face the, the, the great judgment day. How many of you play poker? Or, we're in Nevada, so like, it, it's, yeah. You know, in, in poker, the, the point is to conceal your hand, right? 
And the best players are ones who can seal a bad hand and still win. But there's a point in the poker game where the dealer says, show your cards. Or if you're, if you're bluffing and your bluff is called, you have to show your cards. There's a day coming when we will all have to show our cards. In, in, in the cosmic poker game, if you want to put it that way, where the dealer's going to say, let's see him. It, it, it's really like, sobering to think about, right? They, ha they had it on the spot as a glimpse of what is coming. But Hebrews chapter 4, so let's, let's read this. Chapter 4, verse 12, it should be up on the screen. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We will all stand before God, every single person here. And God judges the heart. We don't get to give him uh, references, like a resume with references. Like, talk to Tony. He can vouch for me. We don't get to do that. It's like everything about us will be laid out on the table. We're going to come face to face with God who knows everything. There is no way we can fool him. We can't lie to him. We can't trick him. Can we take a moment to just meditate on God's infinite knowledge, his omniscience? God has never learned anything. He has possessed all knowledge of all things, of all possibilities of all things, for all of eternity, past, present, future, in perfect clarity. He has, he has never learned anything. He's never forgotten anything. He's, God has, has never said, remind me of your name. It's like, he, he has never at any point lessened an aspect of his knowledge. What did you have for dinner January 8th of 2002? God, God knows exactly what it was, what you thought of it, how hot it was. Every, I mean, he knows every detail about it in perfect clarity. When, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Chicago, and if you've been to Chicago, you know that city is built with bricks. I, I was with a friend, and I was like, God knows every single one of the bricks in this city. And that's not even a fraction of his knowledge, because there's no such thing as a fraction of it, it, infinity. It's like, it, it's, it's not even a drop in the bucket of God's knowledge. And it's unfathomable for us. God knows us down to our deepest, truest selves. He knows who we are at the core. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira's story is, is getting at. It's like, we cannot fool God ever with anything. So why hide? Who can hide from God? Nobody. Who can trick God? Nobody. How does that make you feel? Like, depending on who you are, it could be either very comforting or very terrifying. And I'm not here, like, just trying to be, like, fire and brimstone. Like, I, I had the out. Tony gave me the out. But this is the passage. But it's like, how, how does that make you feel, the, the judgment, and have, having your true self exposed? Like, I think for all of us, what, what we have to recognize is that without Jesus, we are all toast. Can I get an amen on that? It's like, none of us get to stand here and go, well, God, yeah, search me to the fullest capabilities and you're going to really love what you see. <laughs> we don't get to do that. And so that's where Jesus comes in as the one who's like, I, I know you to the, the deepest and, and truest sense of you and I still love you and I'm not going to leave you there. I'm going to have the, the insides match the outsides. What, what you profess will actually be what you practice because my spirit is at work in you. My spirit is actually guiding you to the truth. My spirit is actually going to transform you from the inside out. And it is the connection to Jesus through faith of which that is possible. It is an allegiance to Jesus, a turning to him of which then the spirit fills, the spirit guides, and the spirit leads towards holiness and not hypocrisy. So the big question on judgment day will not be about all the things we've done in our life so much as are we devoted to Christ or not? That is the, the, the core question. Are we devoted to Christ or not? And he is our only hope. Amen? Yeah. So Jesus, by the power of the spirit, is, is turning us from 
hypocrisy to holiness. And I am a recovering hypocrite. Any with me on this? Yes. Like, I'm, I, there's never been a point in my life where I'm like, I do not believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But there has been a huge chunk of my life where I was not living that out. I'll give you a glimpse. I'll give you a glimpse. I was like a junior in college, and I woke up at the crack of noon to the doorbell, and it was some Jehovah's Witnesses at the door. Have you, ever, have you had them come by? Did Jehovah's Witnesses come up to Incline? Are they here? They're here. So you know, like when they come, they usually have some sort of written material. They, want, they have a topic they want to talk to you about. They have, they have something that they want to share. And in this case, they had a newspaper. And, and apparently, there had been some churches in the area, in, in Reno, that were not holding their Christmas services on the Sunday. Christmas fell on a Sunday that year. And instead, they were holding them Christmas Eve, taking the day off to devote to the family. So it's in the paper, and the Jehovah's Witnesses are like, this is an affront to God. Look at this. It's, it's the Lord's day, and they're, they're choosing then instead to devote it to family. This, this is terrible. And so I'm, I'm there at the door, and I'm like, well, I'm a Christian. And, and that's my church right there. I'm, I'm learning of this, right? They're telling me. And I'm like, that's, that's my church, actually, in the newspaper. I'm like, oh, you're a Christian. This is wonderful. Can we come inside? I was like, sure. Because when they stepped inside, they discovered this treasure trove of beer cans from the party my roommates and I threw the night before. And uh, so I'm like sweeping beer cans off the couch, like, here, sit here. And uh, I don't remember what we talked about. I remember they looked really concerned, like the whole time. I, oh, I should mention, they had their eight-year-old daughter with them. Does that make the story better? But it's like, at the door, I was a Christian. Oh, yes, uh, yes, I'm a Christian. Step inside, there's reasonable doubt. <laughs> and God's been doing this transformative work to where you know, step into the house, and there's somewhere it's like, it, it actually matches wh what, I, what I'm professing. And, and that's what the Spirit is doing in us. And it is, a, it is a progressive work. It is not something that happens overnight. It is something that happens over a long period of time where what, what we present as Christians and what we actually live like and do actually matches. That's what the Spirit is doing. And so how do we know if we're filled with him or not? How, how do we know if we're, we're actually being filled with the Spirit or if we are hypocrites like Ananias and Sapphira and filled with Satan? There are a number of answers to this, so I can't give you an exhaustive list. This actually isn't even a list. It's just one point. And it's out of Ananias and Sapphira's story. It, it's that, I, I think the biggest sign is that we care about pleasing God more than pleasing others. Hypocrisy flips this. Because they cared that the community saw them as generous it, and, and being radically generous when they actually weren't. So they cared less about what, what God saw and more about what others saw. And the spirit will flip that where it is caring way more about what God sees than what others see. And so what are some of the symptoms that we're actually trying to boost our reputation? We're trying to bolster our image versus actually honoring God or, or, or trying to please God. There's a few things here. One, we work to make sure that the good we do is seen by others. Like that's the core conviction. Think like the politician with the photo op where it's like they got the hard hat on and the shovel, but they're wearing a suit and you're like, you're not actually doing the work. You know, it's, it's like wanting to make sure that they're out and, and people are seeing that there's, there's the pictures taken and, and on a smaller scale for us, it's just like if we've done a good deed, we want to make sure that someone acknowledges it. Like if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around, does it make a sound? Like the, the underarching principle is kind of like, it, if we do a good deed and no one acknowledges it, should we have done it? It's like, that's the question we have to ask. Are, are we doing the things we do? Are we serving? Are we being generous because we're wanting to please God or we're wanting others to see it and acknowledge us? Second, if, I think another symptom is if we get angry when we don't get the credit for the good deed. Like it, we, we do something for someone, they don't acknowledge it, and so then we're like, oh, that's an injustice. It's, it's the heart saying, like, what we were really in it for was their approval. There's an old quote that everyone loves to be a servant until they're treated like one. And, and I think this is uh, evidence when you get angry. It's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm serving. And you don't get the, the thanks that you think you deserve. And then all of a sudden you're like, I should have gotten that. It's not serving then. 
That's, that's, that's trying to earn something. Or we get envious when others get the credit for something we've done. Or, or, or they're getting credit for being generous. Yeah, Ananias and Sapphira are looking at Barnabas, like probably with some level of, of envy. The text is silent on this, but they're, they're seeing what he's doing and they're like, man, we want to be like that too. Or feeling like the credit that we get for things we do is just not enough. Like, I did all that for you, and all you did was text back THX, which is the laziest form of thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, like that is like kind of feeling like, oh, I, I deserved more for what I did. Or the humble brag. You know what the humble brag is? It's where, where you try to play down what you've done, but you're making sure others know that you've done it. Oh, I'm so exhausted from all the good things I've been doing today. You know, like, like that, that kind of stuff where, where, where you're thinking, like, oh, I just want to present myself as really humble, but I want you to also, like, think I'm humble, which is the opposite of humility. Like, those are some of the symptoms of the deeper disease that, that we are being filled with Satan being guided or, or, or misled, maybe more accurately, by Satan towards hypocrisy, where we want others to give us the praise, but we're less concerned about pleasing God. Those are the symptoms of the deeper disease of worshiping the things of the world and not worshiping the Creator. So Jesus makes us ask, why do we really give our money away? Why do we really help others? Why are we actually serving others? Like he really gives us this introspection. Because in Ananias and Sapphira's story, what's the response of the people who hear about this? Fear. There, there is some element of a healthy fear. And, and I think this story should draw that out in us. Like, am I doing what they're doing? I, am I living like they're living? Could it be me too? Like that, that is not a, a guilt trip. It's, it's a necessary introspection to say, God, I... You're not fooled. I know you're not fooled. Am I fooling myself? Help me. Guide me. Fill me with your spirit. Transform me. Lead me to holiness. God is not fooled. He knows all things about all things. So why do we try to fool ourselves? I think this leads us to an honesty. It leads us to actually recognizing what Jesus has done for us. In the moments where we are hypocritical, we say, Jesus, you are my only hope. You are my only prayer. Without you, I am toast. Amen? Amen. Here's a closing encouragement. So after this story, we see the Spirit is not stopped. The, The Holy Spirit is unimpeded by Ananias and Sapphira. Signs and wonders are being performed. Multitudes are coming to faith in Jesus. The Spirit cannot be stopped, cannot be stopped in us. If, if, If you have put your faith in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not let you go. He will not leave you. He will transform you. God will finish the good work that he began. And there are bumps in the road. There are twists and turns. But God is committed for all of eternity to be with us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, by your spirit, we see you, evidence of you all around us, within us, The fact that we are all here today is a testament to the Spirit's work through human history. The fact that we, in in this community that I have just met, worship the same Lord is evidence of your Spirit being living and active in our world. So I pray for every single person here that they would have a sense of your presence. They would have a sense of your knowledge, your infinite knowledge. God, that every single person here would put their faith in Jesus as the only way to stand on Judgment Day, to stand before you, have the cards shown, and come out on the other end. Because without Jesus, we have no hope, God. But with him, we have eternal hope. Thank you for this community. The, the love and, and kindness they've shown to me in my morning here and, and uh, pray for the Perry family as well that the generosity towards them would, would be evident and that there would be none in this community who has need. As was evidenced in the early church, may that be true today. 
Love you, God, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.